to another episode of the Attic Sessions and this is a very special one. Now we had planned to bring you a garden party spectacular today but it being an Irish summer the weather didn't play ball and we have uh, decided to take the action back to the attic where everything begins anyway and we're in very very good company. It's all about performance in this particular episode and I'm thrilled to say that we are joined by some of the most stellar performers in the Irish poetry scene today, um, members of the Poetry Divas. Um, And we're also going to have music from Tommy Keyes a a little later. Um, But first of all, the Divas and from left, my left to right, we have Kate Dempsey, Barbara Smith and Maeve O'Sullivan. You're all very welcome. Thanks for for coming in. Um, Kate, can I ask you a little about the background of the Divas? How did it all start? Well, um, I think the idea really was that we we wanted to perform poetry together as a as a group and certainly um, as as a maybe a slightly older poets. We we just like the idea of getting out there. We really like actually reading. um, I don't know what you think. But it's, I think some of the best gigs are when you read to people who are not used to poetry. Yeah, mm. you get that, those yeah. lovely reactions. I don't like poetry, but I like yours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's what, so we've done lots of different events around. Um, and you've been in places yeah. like Electric Picnic, and yeah. um, where else are you in? Um, Castle Palooza, uh, Kildare Readers Festival, Dublin Writers Festival, lots of different places, Allingham. Very good. And uh, just back from beautiful West Cork and Annam Cara. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all the way down to Barra. So you get all the, all the good places. Well, we're going to discover why now. Um, I'm going to basically hand the floor over to the divas for the next while. So I'll get out of shot and let you on with it. OK, so <clears throat> I'm Maeve and I'm going to read uh, two poems that were inspired, two short poems inspired by my late parents. So the first one uh, is based on a random comment that my mum made when she was many years ago when she was alive and well and her vivacious and slightly bonkers self. And this is called You Could Go Anywhere in That Blouse. Summer 1996. But where should I go, mum, in the blouse that washes like a dream? To the moon or Mars, maybe? Or just out for strawberries and cream? Summer 2006. Her surprise call comes through on the freeway south of L.A. I say, this will cost a fortune. Are your clothes working out okay? And the second one is uh, called Trialet, uh, which is the, the name of the form that the poem is in. One of the songs he'd sing was the darling girl from Clare. All the listeners would cling to each of the songs he'd sing. But now I find them haunting like a mantra or a prayer. One of the songs he'd sing was The Darling Girl from Clare. And over to Kate. Yep, Uh, my name's Kate Dempsey. I'm going to read a poem that was, I was really excited that it was uh, highly commended in the Forward Prize. And it's a kind of a um, covertly feminist poem while it lasted. One day when I was 13, my mother's hands fell off. They rolled under the table, giving the cat a bit of a turn. We looked at them, but they gave no sign. A couple of twitches, and that was that. Mum stood at the chopping board, still as a goalpost. Dad made a lie on the chaise while he put on the potatoes. She lay, holding her bloody stumps high so they wouldn't make a mess of the gold velvet. Dad cooked the dinner and dished up. We gave her a plate too, but how could she eat it? Don't mind me, she said. I gave her a bite of my ham and all of my broccoli. Dad asked if he wanted to, she wanted to call the doctor. I don't want to make a fuss. The cat jumped on her lap, but having no hands, Mum couldn't stroke her nor tip her off. She rubbed her head against my mother's cheek, then left to wind in and out of my legs instead, purring, which she never did before. You go off and enjoy yourself, Mum said. So I went and watched Top of the Pops with the door shut, tied up my school blouse, danced on the rug like Pan's people and didn't turn down the volume for the loud ones. 
Dad asked if she wanted to go to the pub. I don't want to be in the way, she said, and read the same page of the paper over and over. The next day, I made my own school lunch and had toast for breakfast instead of Weetabix. Dad put Mum's hands neatly in a Tupperware box and stored them next to the lentils. Don't worry about me, said Mum. I'll get by. Weeds grew, dust gathered, the cat shed ginger hairs. We lived on fish and chips and Chinese. Dad shopped and washed, I cooked and cleaned. We gave up ironing and cabbage and mowing the lawn. Mum's stumps healed up nicely. On the chef, shelf next to the mouldy lentils, her hands shriveled like marigold seeds. Then the cat caught a blackbird, ate it, sicked it up all over the hall floor. We stared at the lake, vomit and feathers. It was good while it lasted, Mum sighed. She opened the Tupperware with her teeth, screwed both hands back in and filled the bucket with hot soapy water. Well, they say a woman's work is never done, and I suppose this is upon the same theme. It's actually about my grandmother. This is roosters. My granny used to soak the spuds too, making it easy to peel them later. Part of morning's ritual was topping their pot with water. Later, after fowl were fed and tea and bread were ate, she'd peel them slowly, humming all the while a medley of Moore's Almanac songs. Steeping my potatoes now as she did brings her four green fields down the years to me. Scaly and red, these roosters, instead of her soft queens. Mine tattle of modern machinery. Long scars that I smooth away with a stainless peeler. I split them with a long broad knife, rinse them down and leave them by for dinner. Okay, um, next poem I'm going to read is a sonnet. And it's an ekphrastic poem. So it was inspired by a photograph of two, two film stars, which was hanging on a hotel room in Porto. Inside room 102 of this Art Deco cinema hotel, a youngish Orson holds his second wife, a most erotic black and white embrace. His right hand firmly grasps her pale left arm. Her head tilts slightly back and to the left the lips just barely parted with suspense. The lady from Shanghai is being shot, a tale of murder, lust, deception, guns, and Rita's shorter bleach blonde tresses are framing her femme fatale, Elsa. Her neck and shoulders are completely bare, an eyelash casts a shadow on her cheek. She leans back for the kiss and holds her breath, then tumbles into drink, dementia, death. Uh, and th my next poem's um, about uh, w when kids can't bring things home from school that they've made in school or playgroup and you don't know what it is. Uh, it's called... Um, you've, uh, it's what you put into it. On the last day of term, you bought home a present placed it under the tree, a light chest-shaped mystery, wrapped in potato stamp paper, intricate with angels and stars. Christmas morning you watched as we opened it, cautious not to tear the covering. Inside a margarine tub, empty. Do you like it? Eyes huge. It's beautiful. What is it, sweetheart? A box full of love, you said. You should know, oh my darling girl, it sits on the dresser still, and from time to time we open it. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So this is an apologia. It's the sort of poem you write when you've done something very bold the night before. I leave this at your ear for when you wake. The beautiful six-string banjo that I stole from the musician's corner when it, where it hung in the window suspended, cast off by the best after dandling it, last song ever played on its sonorous strum. This is the gift that I bring home to you, from the house where the clocks always read ten to two, and tankards are strewn round the walls as though thrown high by drunken trolls, 
a banjo with an engraved silver bridge left here for you to pick notes from its tight, silent drum. And we're going to stay with the music theme for another little while. And uh, this poem is fairly self-explanatory. Um, it's set in Leitrim at a traditional music Irish festival, Irish music festival even. And it's called Vocal Chords. And it's the title, uh, title poem of my book of the same name, collection of the same name. Vocal Chords. The Sligo train takes me to the singing place, the place where mines and quarries can be treacherous and the undertaker buys more than his fair share of drink. Where the famine graveyard is a single field, the sun shining on its silent slope this afternoon as my friend refuses to play a flute lament. I am here to sing and sing I do in a classroom of women who have journeyed to this town to do the same. We learn 20 songs together from Belik Rosie with the red jacket and the ready laugh. We sing about the good ship kangaroo, the bonny bunch of roses and the verdant braise of screen. We sing next door to the harpers and fiddlers we drink tea with the box players and the set dancers. We nod to the baron and whistle players. We sing. Our instruments are invisible. We carry them everywhere. They are our own and only they can marry the words to the tunes. In Monica's bar, we swap songs like beads, applause stringing this one to the next. We sing of emigration, of love charmed or doomed, of death and Napoleon. We can't stop singing except to listen to another song. We don't want the singing to stop, but voices will not hold out forever without a break. The train home is silent. Um, this is a poem about really about the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories we tell each other. Um, this in particular is about um, some of the more elaborate engagements that you get. It's I could lie. I could make it up. I could tell you it was in a fancy restaurant, cushioned in raspberry mousse, sweeter than velvet. I could say it was a summer night, a plump moon, pink champagne, roses. I could lie and say it took me by surprise. I cried, he cried, diners clapped, waiters cheered, fireworks filled the sky, harps, violins. But it was not so. It was Saturday morning, a supermarket run, an underground car park. It was a zip stuck on my jacket. He knelt down, jeans skimming an oil stain. I looked at his head, touched the thinning patch that so tall no one else knew was there but me. His hands tugging the zip, his breath steaming like exhaust fumes. And I said, while you're down there, while you're down there, why don't you ask me? Smiling up, he did. I could tell you it was like this. Okay, uh, love to skate. Oh, sorry. Okay, achieving the lotus gate. In winter, the uphill path to Madame Jing's is treacherous. I watch for loose stones among the grey brown gravel, and the birds are almost silent as each step quarries me, wincing on wooden patterns. Madame unravels yards of stinking cotton from my feet and her thorough thumbs knead them from numbness. She honours my feet with warmed water, loosening shedding skin, trims each bruised nail to the quick. She rebinds each foot in cotton length, soaked in herbs and animal blood. A neat figure of eight turns over and step gathers toes underfoot and round the heel each pass tighter than the last and then my thoughts cringe homewards as i totter out under a brittle moon my own weight crushing each foot into the correct shape like most people i enjoy traveling and uh, i think like most writers I, I find it quite inspirational just being in a different environment a different stimuli and I'm fortunate to have a friend living in northeast Italy who I visit every, every now and then. And this is a sequence of haiku that I wrote. Uh, the region is called Friuli and the sequence is called Friuli Dusk. Grado Promenade, 
daughter linking mother, scentless oleander. Friuli dusk, an old woman in green closing her shutters. A lizard scuttles between two stones, World War I monument. Murano Island, an exchange of glasses reveals a glass eye. Its heart shape taking some of the sting out, mosquito bite. August raindrops, trying to catch up, city fountain. Crunch of karst underfoot, cicada song above, Rilke way. Such stillness, this cliff top castle, its stringed instruments. Miramar Castle, the view of Trieste clearer after last night's storm. Uh, for my last poem, um, I'm reading a reading one called Verbatim. Um, I've lived in Ireland for more than twenty years now, and when I first came here, what one of the one of the many things that took a bit of getting used to was how the Irish use swearing as punctuation, as adjectives, as nouns, as verbs, adverbs, prepositions. Uh, and this old lady explained to me where this all comes from. Verbatim. It's all the fault of the British, she said. The cursing came in with the troopers, the other ranks and their wives as bad. Before that, we Irish never swore. No curse would pass our tender lips, no drop of whiskey, no beatings, no casual cruelty. Sure weren't we a gentle race, until the squad is boated in. We were milk and honey, the soft heads of babes, the pigs at Christmas, root vegetables and stone walls. What did we have to swear about, until the British came? Whoa. Last poem, <clears throat> and this is, I guess, what you would call a changing room poem, and it's the sort of poem that any woman who's ever gone into a changing room to try on something may recognise. Specular effect. It's bad luck to centre yourself between two mirrors, to rear your view, check the jeans cut, see your eyes horrified, by an infinity of huge arses. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're on to our last. We're going to finish up with this, yeah? Yeah, so we're going to finish up with um, this poem called Pear Bond. And it has become a tradition amongst the divas to take turns. And we have illustrations as well. Humorous illustrations. It was written by Barbara, who's too modest to, to say that. I know. <clears throat> and it is, of course, dedicated to Dolly Parton. <laughs> the talk in the bar lulls a half-time fill as I knife-scrape the head from another pint. He hovers, pocket-footering his change. Steadying for the ask, he addresses my full frontals, my baby buggy bumpers. My Brad Pitts, my boulders, my billabongs, my squashy cushions, my soft focus bristles, my motherly bosoms, my matronly bulk, my Mickey and Minnie, my Monica, Lewinsky's, my Isaac Newtons, my snow tires, my speed bumps, my Tweedle twins, my milk makers, my Mobutus, my num nums. My Pia's Adoras, my Pointer Sisters, my Honkers, my Hooters, my Hubcaps, my Hummers, my Eartha Kitts, my Eisenhowers, my God's Milk Bottles, my Picasso Cubes, my Chesticles, my Cha Chas, my Coconuts, my Dairy Pillows, my Devil's Dumplings, my Ejectified Orbs, my Uber Boobs, my One Parts Lara, my Two Parts Globe. My skyward pips, my lift and separate. My airbags, my feeders, my mammy glands, my bob and ray, my big bouncing buddhas, my sweater stretchers, my sweet potatoes. My rosaceous rotors, my trusty rivets, my meliferous melons, my ma my tarty, my taut, my pert pelucas. 
my Jahubis, my kicking Kawangas, my Agravic Gobstoppers, my Immodest Maids, my Scooby Snacks, my Squished In Schlobes, my Cupcakes, my Soda Breads, my Bloomin' Baps, my Brilliant Bangers, my Brash Bazookas, my Windscreen Wipers, my Winnebago's, my wop up a loop up bop up a loose my yahoos, my yazoos, and yipping yin yangs, my paps, my pips, my pommes de terre, my pushed up, plunged down, paraded balcony, my slow reveal, my instant appeal, my decolletage, my fool's mirage. And I watch him pay up, steady up, and leave. <laughs> Keys, you're very welcome to the Attic Sessions. Thank you, Nessa. Um, now, you've just launched your first album, An Irish Life, uh, over the summer. And uh, thanks for coming to sing actually a song that's not on that first album, but on uh, another one of the albums. There are three in total. Do you want to tell us a bit about the song? Yeah, I, I've recorded three albums. And uh, this song I want to do is off an album called Some of These Stories Are True. But the reason I want to do it is because we're here in the Attic Sessions. And the song is Surprised by Joy, which is my musical adaptation of one of your poems, which you were kind enough a couple of years ago to, to give me permission to use. So I thought that would be the most appropriate one to do today. So this is Surprised by Joy, and I hope you like it. Super. Looking forward to hearing it. Well, that was wonderful stuff. Thank you very much, Tommy Keys, and of course, Ellen O'Mahony, uh, backing vocalist and keyboard solo there. Thank you so much, both of you, for being in the attic. And if you liked that, you can hear lots of Tommy's songs on his website, tommykeys.com. So why not go over there and check it out? And that's that for another episode of the Attic Sessions, a very special one, I think you'll agree. And thanks again to all our guests tonight, um, the Poetry Divas, so that's Kate Dempsey and Barbara Smith and Maeve O'Sullivan. And then Tommy Keyes and his uh, accompanist, Ellen O'Mahony. So until next month, when we come to you again from our attic in Rathfarnham, 
Thanks very much for watching. Yes, I know that I'm just a dreamer. I dream because it's the closest I'll ever get to you. Thanks for having us. And Peter. And Baxter. <laughs>